Hey folks, welcome back to another Let's Talk About video where I briefly discuss and review the other games I've been playing besides Monster Hunter. Today we're going to talk about a sci-fi metroidvania game called Darklight by Mirai and Co, who as far as I could tell have only made one other game called Dark and Light. So yeah, that, that's where we're starting on this one. Now what had originally drawn me to Darklight was the art style. It's almost like claymation, I don't know, it's kind of weird, but paired with the super dingy lighting, it looks pretty unique, and I really dig it. The whole setting in general is exactly what I love, it's a sci-fi horror theme that reminds me a lot of like Dead Space. The backdrops and the environments really paint a picture of human technology like skyrocketing to untold levels, and then they crossed the line and it all fell down. Even though the theme and artistic designs are what sold me on the game, I also do enjoy Metrovania style games. And so this was a pretty easy pickup for me, even though it only had a handful of reviews. As far as Metroidvania games goes, this one is pretty cookie cutter. I would say there's not much to be surprised about in terms of like game mechanics or ideas. There's only one movement ability to unlock, which is the dash, which you get after like the first boss. So there's never really a reason to go back and backtrack as you would pretty much get everything always. Most Metroidvania games do a lot of backtracking with the constant need of a new different mobility option. Some people dislike that about those types of games. I could take it or leave it, doesn't really matter to me. The bigger issue I had with exploring and traveling was that there was never anything exciting to find. There's only like three types of interactable objects in the entire game. Chests, which contain an item, either a consumable or a weapon, and we'll touch on that in a second. The occasional shrine, which offer you a temporary like buff or skill until you die. And another shrine-like object that are kind of rare, they just summon enemies so you can farm up some materials. There was never anything like a secret room that unlocked a side boss who dropped a unique weapon or anything like that. There were only a few like hidden walls in the entire game, and they only ever contained like a shrine or a chest, which was kind of a letdown. But I mean, that's not the end of the world. Darklight only had a very few short platforming puzzles, if you even want to call them puzzles, which I really wish they did more of, because that's another fun part about these types of games, and that's usually different from other genres. Being able to use all the mobility tools you have to traverse areas can be fun and a nice way to break away from the combat from time to time. Grime did a great job at this, so I was left wishing that there was more to do. But speaking of combat and stuff, let's discuss combat and items. So your character has three item slots and a skills page. The items are a gun, a melee weapon, and a consumable. There are only three consumables in the game. A shot grenade for robotic enemies, of which I think there's only like three. A uh, fire grenade, which is supposed to work better on flesh, but I found that it didn't really do any damage ever. And a turret, which was actually pretty solid. Consumables never get upgraded or have tiers or anything like that, so I felt like the grenades to be largely useless, as even in the beginning of the game they were doing pretty much no damage. They just ended up taking too long to throw, and enemies move super fast in this game, so turrets were the only thing I really ended up using. The guns and melee weapons were surprisingly lacking for, you know, originally what I thought was going to be a very robust system. I don't understand why they have like a rarity system in this game at all. Some weapons have like weird different colors, names, and backgrounds, and the rarity, but it's just like all over the place. Like a rare weapon has like a gray background and a yellow name, or an epic item has like a red name but a purple background, but a different rare item has a purple background and a yellow name. Like it, it was super confusing, and not only that, but there's only like a handful of weapons in the game to begin with, so I don't understand why this naming thing was even a thing. I believe it found a total of like 6 melee weapons and like 6 different guns, but I believe there's like one more feature of those that I didn't find. Now lack of weapons isn't necessarily a detriment, look at Bloodborne, I think that base game had like 9 weapons and 3 guns. But what was annoying was that they all felt really samey, all the guns except the last two, which I found literally right before the last boss, all sounded and felt like little pea shooters. The melee weapons were a bit more different in their movesets as you can do a variety of attacks depending on your inputs like pushing down or up and attacking will do trips and juggles. Some melee weapons also have hold to charge attacks, but not all. So the melee weapons were a bit more fine, and I honestly spent more time using the melee weapons in this game than guns. I know, crazy right? Not using guns. Because the game also just threw so many enemies at you that the guns were just ineffective as they can only really hit one enemy at a time, 
and melee weapons could at least do some forms of AoE by slashing all the enemies at once. I think the last gun I picked up could fire a laser that pierced and that was cool, but like I said it was literally right before the last boss, so that was kind of a letdown. Weapons can be upgraded for some more damage and augments with gems to give them elemental damage, which was cool, but you can't change the gems ever, so if you have a gun and you put a fire gem in it, you have two other gem slots, they have to be fire. You can't remove your gem either. So it's a shame when you get like a rare weapon and you don't really have one to spare, you're kind of locked into one choice. And that's pretty much the extent of the items and weapons in the game. It was cool, but pretty shallow. The skills system was also kind of a letdown. In the first half of the game, you don't have any skills at all, except the temporary ones you pick up from shrines around the maps, but again, those go away if you die. Depending on the shrine, they'll grant you a type of skill, either fire or lightning, which are based on the two factions of the game. Well, when you get to that point in the game where you can actually pick your faction, which is like halfway through, that's when you get your permanent skill trees, which are just those skills that you are already unlocking and picking from the shrines, you just get those permanently. Unfortunately, you don't get to see the actual skill trees or anything before you pick a faction, and then you get locked out of the other tree when you pick a faction. The skills themselves are actually pretty cool thematically. I did like all the lightning chains and novas that the knights faction had provided, but I feel like I wish I had picked the blood wolves since they had more stuff that would synergize with my style. But well, the problem I had with the skills were a similar problem that I had with the consumables, and that was that they cast way too slowly and enemies move way too fast. So it was almost always more effective to just use a melee weapon or a gun instead. There really wasn't a way to scale spell damage as far as anything I could tell. There's only two upgradable stats, which is your life and stamina. So your mana pool was always the same size and your spell damage is always pretty low. The skills were fine for AoE purposes, but that was basically it. So unfortunately, I didn't really use the skills all that much. I like the ideas of all the skills, and splitting them between factions is kind of fine. I just wish there was some more balance work that went between them, because I really couldn't find a use for them like at all. But let's discuss combat in general to get a better picture. So starting out, I thought combat was pretty cool. There was a fair amount of enemies, you could tackle them however you pleased, you could roll through them, then shoot, you could parry, then melee, throw grenades, you name it, just kind of go have fun. And I was actually enjoying it. The parry window though is super tight and you do take huge amounts of damage if you fail at parry because enemies will just beat on you forever. Also parry doesn't work on most bosses so you really don't have that option there, but it's absolutely mandatory on all the humanoid bosses, which are the last few and if you don't parry there, there's no way you're going to be able to deal with those fights. So parrying is in a weird state of being useless on some enemies and bosses, but mandatory on others, so you kind of have to get used to it regardless. There are also a lot of invisible enemies in this game, which you do get a small alert for when they're close, but invisible enemies move insanely fast as well, so those will be a bulk of the damage you take in the game. I found them very annoying at first, but then as I get used to it, ultimately became more of a, just a nuisance rather than annoyance. The problems with combat arose in the later half of the game, where they just start throwing more and more enemies at you, like a lot. The screen will have 5 or 6 enemies moving insanely fast and just bum rushing you. Parrying becomes a death sentence at that point, because then all the enemies just attack you while you're trying to parry. And guns can really only shoot one enemy at a time, so basically you just have to melee. I found that a lot of my combat loop was just doing the ground pound to stun enemies for a second, melee them a couple times, and then roll until the ground pound was available again. It got kind of tedious and boring near the end, and then when I realized there was nothing to gain from killing enemies, I ended up just running past most of them, which isn't really what you want in a game. I get that running past enemies in zones you've already cleared is really common in metroidvania games, especially when you're just going back to explore or collect stuff, but I was doing it for progression and I was just running through enemies left and right. The role is highly effective at that, so that was cool at least. Also in the later half of the game, the bosses got some absurd levels of difficulty creep. Like there's a lot of unavoidable damage. Like one boss, Clover, super annoying. You can't shoot it from the front because it's got a shield, and you can't parry it either, so you have to hit it from the back. And if you roll past them, he's just going to turn around and keep attacking you. So you have to like roll right before he does an attack so you can get enough time to swing a couple times and then, you know, finish his attack and then go back and forth kind of thing. But if you touch the boss, you get hurt. So as you roll through its attacks and stuff, you're pretty much constantly getting hurt for just touching it in melee range. It's kind of annoying. And some of the last bosses also have like this huge bullet hell like screen AoEs that felt really out of place. And I legitimately can't see a way to avoid all the damage. Our character just doesn't have the tools for it. Now outside of these attacks, the bosses weren't too hard, it just felt bad sitting there spamming heals while I wait for the attacks to end because there's just no way to avoid all the damage you take. I'm not really sure how the developers intended the players to do these fights because the bosses just move so much faster than the player is capable of. Like We only have a roll and a dash which has no iframes, there's no block and we can't exactly parry explosions and AoEs. 
So I was getting a little annoyed towards the end of the game with the lack of meaningful progression, skills feeling too slow to be worthwhile, and the huge swarms of enemies basically forcing me to just spam melee and ground pound. And then the bosses, so yeah. I think the meat of the game is really great. Like I said, I love the art style, the sci-fi horror theme in the beginning of the game. It was really good, it reminded me a lot of Dead Space originally. But I think a lot of polish is needed. And then there are a few other complaints I want to vocalize that are, I don't really know where to fit them in, and I hope I'm not the only one who thought about this. First, regarding the Dead Space reference. So if you have played Dead Space, you have to like stomp on enemies to confirm that they're dead, and they have that in this. Use it early on with like the basic enemies and parasites, and it's straight up the animation from Dead Space. But as you get further in the game, most enemies just fall down when they die, and then rather than wait to be stomped, they just explode after like 5 seconds, which is kind of weird. I feel like the game was designed around finishing off enemies with a stomp, but they kind of gave up and just made enemies explode after the stomp timer would fade. It felt really weird, and then I don't understand why the stomp mechanic is in at all when it's only used on the first few enemies. It just feels super out of place. Another slight issue I had, very slight, was when using the mana flask, and I will say flask here, because when you use the mana recharge item, it makes the exact same sound effect as leveling up in Path of Exile, and every time I did it, it just, it bugged me. It was really weird. I have no idea why that sound effect is there, or why it was borrowed, or what. And my last bit of a complaint here is that there is an execution animation when you finish off the humanoid enemies from the factions and their infected versions. The execution animation, I swear, is straight up from the Surge. I wish I had Surge clips to show you, but it's another one of those things that I saw and then it really bugged me every time I kept seeing it. The other weird thing about the executions is that there's no prompt or anything like that, like they just kind of do it when you kill these guys with a melee attack. So it feels like another one of these borrowed features that they were going to use, but then after a few enemies they're like, nah, that's fine. So between these weird borrowed mechanics and their lack of thorough integration, the game feels just entirely different between like the first and second half, and I get the feeling that the game was just kind of rushed out to finish. The game was only $14 on Steam, and I feel like it was at least worth the playthrough. I mean, the price is right, though I did finish it in like 9 hours, I completed all the bosses, I did all the quests and all the side quests for my faction. I didn't see any form of New Game Plus, you just kind of end the game right before the last boss when you're done, but I don't really have any motivation to go through it again. But there are worse ways to spend $14, so I'm not going to say that the price isn't right. So it was fun, and I enjoyed the first half of the game, but overall it just feels kinda off. Like, there's lots of ideas that really didn't come together, and it looks like there's a lot of conflicting designers trying to get their ideas on the table, and then like, they have a lot of like, half-baked mechanics and stuff. So, it's kind of in a weird state, and I'll just kinda leave it at that. But anyway, that's all for me, thank you all for watching, and good luck out there, hunters.